Hey, welcome to the Iceberg Lounge, which is now heard in eight countries around the world. I'm your host, Tommy Single, and on today's show, we'll be talking to the youth pastor of the First United Methodist Church in Jasper, Alabama, Stuart Brandstetter. This is his second time on the show, but instead of talking about music, today we will hear his testimony. So let's get into the interview. All right. Hey, Stu, how are you? Doing well, man. How are you? I'm doing good. Um, So we're here today to talk about your testimony and how God has shaped your life to where you're at today. Um, This is this is your story. Um, So let's start about your life before Christ. So my life before Christ was kind of your, your average, I guess, upbringing in Florida. Um, my, my parents were born and raised in Horse Cave, Kentucky. And for my dad, he was raised in a very Southern Baptist home. So church for him almost kind of felt like a place that he had to go. Mm. Um, whether it was raining, whether it was snowing, no matter what the weather was, they were there on church every Sunday. Um, and so when we moved to Florida, it was church was kind of in the back of our minds, but not necessarily at the forefront of kind of what we're doing. Um, I can honestly, I don't remember going to a vacation Bible school. I'm sure I did, but it's not one of those memories that's engraved in the back of my mind. Same, uh, same here. Yeah, and, and so um, and so really, but before I kind of made, I guess, my faith journey, church was kind of just one of those places to where it's like, okay, cool, but why? Yeah. I, I just, I never really understood it. Uh, we would pray before meals, but that about be the only time we would pray as a family because we, again, being raised in a Baptist home or my dad being raised in a Baptist home, my mom being raised in a Methodist home, um, we're going to pray before meals. Yeah, um, it's, it's just kind of what we did. And so, I mean, I guess my faith journey, so to say, my salvation story um, starts when I was in about sixth grade. Um, I didn't go to confirmation in the Methodist Church. We have this thing called confirmation, to where it's like the introduction of faith for uh, upcoming sixth graders. And my brother was going to a Methodist youth group um, at Lynn Haven United Methodist Church. It was about maybe two blocks from our house um, at the time, so we could ride our bikes and walk to youth group. Okay, um, it was kind of cool. Yeah, and. The I, I went to youth group. I, my brother was there. Uh, my some of my friends were there, and so it was unlike anything that I've ever experienced. Um, and I, I had a I had a moment with God when I was in seventh grade. Um, I, I went I went to camp. I can remember my my friend at the time. Austin gave me a CD. Um, that's back when people used to give each other CDs <laughs> yeah. on it. Um, he gave me a CD and it had like all these different, I guess, contemporary Christian songs. Um, the funny thing about it was he used LimeWire to get the songs. Oh wow! And so it's it's hilarious <laughs> because we we used an illegal website to download no. illegally Christian songs to give to somebody. It's just funny how all that works. The early internet. The yeah. early internet, and so. Um, he gives me this CD. I'm listening to it. I, I go to this thing called Camp Lee. Um, I had an incredible time. I'm still kind of early, but I knew that there was something something in my life was missing. Yeah. And so in seventh grade, I, I knelt down. I had this bunk bed. It was a queen on the bottom, twin on the top. Um, it was blue. It had a ladder on the side. And I'm on I'm on the edge of the bed. Um, when I kneel down, I pray, and I, I, ex- I ask Christ to come into my heart. Um, and I can remember going and telling my mom, um, and my mom instantly calls the pastor at the time, and we had this kind of big hurrah, boohoo, crying, hugging moment, um, and uh, I get baptized uh, about a, a week or two later, and I, I wish I could sit here and tell people that I made that decision, everything was gravy since then, um, but the reality of it was, that's not the case. Um, so I made that decision, and then on comes eighth grade. Uh, eighth grade, I'm a, I'm a top dog at the school. 
I'm, I'm playing soccer. Um, and then I get involved in the wrestling team at the middle school. Okay. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but yeah. I was a wrestler. I did not know this until now, yeah. actually. I, I, I wrestled in eighth grade. Um, I was the second lightest weight class. Okay. Um, so that's still under 100 pounds <laughs> in eighth grade. Um, but just, I started hanging out with the wrong crowd. Um, I started doing more and more bad things um, to you know, stop going to church. Uh, my, my profanity got worse and worse. Um, I started hanging out with other friends, and you know I kind of just willingly kind of just walked away. Yeah. And it it was it wasn't that I was upset. It was just I got so caught up in life and friends and going from one group to the next. And the friends that I hung out with in my neighborhood weren't going to church. Uh, my teammates on the wrestling team weren't going to church. My teammates on my soccer team weren't going to church. And so you know when you're in middle school. You're going to go wherever your friends are. Yeah. And my friends weren't going to church. And so I was like, nah, not for me right now. Um, then ninth grade comes along, um, Go to went to Mosley High School. And that's I think that's when things kind of took a turn for the worse for me. Um, started playing um, soccer. Started really getting uh, more attention from girls mm -hmm. because, yeah. you know, I, w I was a little guy. Uh, yeah. I, was, I was small. But um, there was some other middle schools that transferred in to Mosley. And so I'm seeing girls from other, other middle schools and all these different things. And all of a sudden, I go from being, oh, he's just cute to, oh, he's cute. Yeah. And when, when you're not used to that attention, you thrive for it. Oh, yeah. You love it. And, you know, the, the way – my my soccer journey and my faith journey play together it's incredible because the so freshman year um no freshman made varsity um all of the freshmen made jv and then there was a girls team that made that jv team too and so what would end up happening is whenever soccer season would come around I would get a girlfriend from the soccer team yeah you know. and, and it just makes sense right yeah it makes sense and so get I got into a relationship. It was unhealthy. Um, I got into actually multiple relationships, and they're all just unhealthy. Like, and a lot of it was on me. Uh, I turned two best friends against each other. Oof. Uh, because Oof. It, I, I was I was a ninth grader. I didn't care. No. It's like okay, yeah, okay, bye. You're gone. Yes, you're next. Um, also, ninth grade is when I, I really started drinking. Uh, ninth grade is when I first started smoking weed um, and just really got into a bad crowd. Yeah. Um, I can remember going into my sophomore year. So it was the ninth grade summer going into my sophomore year. Mm -hmm. I was playing soccer. Uh, soccer was my life. Every single day playing soccer, there is this indoor facility called Renegade about, I would say, 14 blocks away from my house. Okay. Um, I would run to there with a soccer ball, just dribbling it play for two hours run back um simply it, i had nothing else to do i had no job and i wanted to do that um i can remember having a conversation with one of my buddies that just got back from camp lee a guy that i would you know do drugs with play soccer with i said he came up to my house and said dude i can't wait um we got, i got some good stuff for us and he said man i hate to tell you but um i don't do that anymore okay, okay. and i was like what he said, man, I, I have to tell you my, my experience that I had at camp, my, my real encounter with Jesus. And then he proceeds to tell me this story about how, you know, he was just in the back playing too cool for school. And then somebody else came up to him just in tears saying, I'm so sick of this. Um, I'm tired of this lifestyle. And um, it's amazing how in faith journeys and in salvation stories, Oftentimes, when we see somebody else making a change, we get inspired to make a change for ourselves. Yeah. And so that's what my friend saw. And then he told me that story. And then I said, man, I, I want that. I don't know why I'm doing all this stuff. And so I made a dramatic turn um, my going into my sophomore year of drugs, drinking, being promiscuous with girls to cold turkey. Mm. Cold turkey everything. 
from the music I listened to. Now, let's not forget, that's back when the Carter 2 just dropped. Yeah, that's uh, that's really And before. the Carter 3 was about to come out. Yeah, and I was a huge Lil Wayne fan. Yeah, Lil Wayne was about to, like, mm-hmm. blow up. And so, you know, that's because the year before, Lil Wayne came out, you know, the song Fireman. And yeah. everybody was bumping that in my school. And so um, that was my life. That was the things I was inputting into me. Um, and then I made a drastic change. And that's when I discovered Lecrae and uh, the 116 Click and Trip Lee and Tadashi and all these guys. And it was the music that I enjoyed, but they had a message behind it. Yeah. And I can remember uh, my friend telling his youth leaders what I was doing. And they were astonished because they were like, no way. Like, you're joking, right? Like, I was that guy. Yeah. And it was a reputation that I built for myself. Um, I'm not necessarily happy about it, but I own it. That was a part of me. And I can remember going to church, and we, and things started drastically changing. Um, but again, soccer season comes back. And sure enough, my mindset is, soccer season's here. i got to have a girlfriend. Yeah, I just have to. It's, it's, it's part of the season. It's part of the season. And so I ended up getting into a relationship with a girl. I got into a relationship my freshman year. I should have known better. No. But I told her about my faith journey and kind of what God was working in my life. And she said, oh, that's awesome. I want that too. And so I thought that by us being in a relationship together, we can make things work and try to keep God at the center. Boy, was I wrong. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, and that's why, that's why I try to tell kids all the time. Yeah. I said, listen, don't jump into a relationship when you're not good with yourself. Like, I was like I was fresh back in the streets of church, like, and we were doing Bible studies for lunch. Um, we were, me and my buddy Austin, uh, we really were, were a movement of trying to get people to come to church. Mm. And we would do it in such a way to say, hey, man, just come. Just, yeah. Hey, I, I got you. If anybody says anything, don't worry. Um, I'll vouch for you. Um, and so, so all that happened. Um, I get into this relationship. Soccer season comes back around, and then I'm 16 now, so I'm driving. And my my parents tell me, "Hey, sir, once you turn 16, you have to go get a job." Mm, yeah. I said, "Okay, I'll go get a job." My brother was a busboy at this restaurant called the Treasure Ship. Um, he's been doing it for years. He's two and a half years older than me. And the, he hooks me up with a job. So I get this job. I go out there. I have my WWJD bracelet on. You, you always know, have to have that. Always got to have that. Um, I had a a nail that had, um, uh, by his stripes, we were healed. The, the verse in Isaiah on it that I found on the ground around a chain. That's sick, though. And, like, I, w- I had a cross necklace. Like, I was showing up to work ready to preach the gospel to people. <laughs> yeah. And I was smacked in the face with reality mm-hmm. of my manager saying, hey, you have to take all that stuff off. You can't wear that here. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh. First taste of the world. First taste of the, first taste of the reality that's yeah. out there. And, you know, I was, I was in church. I was around church people. But then I get a job, and my boss is telling me I can't do this. So I take it off, and they, they worked me long hours. And so my work schedule sophomore year that summer was Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, more than likely a double on Saturday. Mm-hmm. I took Sunday and Monday off to be my weekend. One, restaurant days on Sundays were terrible anyways. Mondays are a bad night too. Um, and so because of that, I couldn't really come to church. Uh, my youth group normally met on um, Wednesday nights and Sunday nights. Sundays I was so exhausted from work that I would just just stay home. And you're still, like, doing soccer yeah. during this time, yeah. too. And let's not forget, I'm still 16 years old. Yeah. And so I can remember going back to church one Wednesday when I had off. This was about um, a week or, or really a month into the summer. And I remember walking in and seeing a youth leader. And I'll, I'll never forget what he said. He goes, oh, so, so glad you could finally join us. Said that to me. Mm. And... I said, in the back of my mind, I was like, I'm done. Yeah. I, I am I am 100% done. This is the last thing that I need. And so I, I turned. Um, when they, they prayed, they went to go into worship. When they went to worship, I snuck out. Mm, I left. Yeah. I went home. I wanted nothing to do with it. Um, and then, you know, 
all goes into my junior year. Um, I, again, I don't I don't get back into drinking or smoking, but the promiscuous with girls is the soccer season comes back up. Got to have a girlfriend. Yeah, part of the season. Um, it's part. It's it's amazing how that that actually was. But um, I don't I don't I stop going to church. Uh, my mouth just gets filthy. I start start you know breaking rules, just doing really type of stupid things. Um, and then going into my, that summer, going into my senior year, um, Sunday, I'm playing soccer. Um, I'm playing soccer at that same indoor facility. And it gets over, and then all of a sudden, it just feel, starts filling up with teenagers. And um, in pops my old youth pastor. In pops another youth pastor, people that I know. I'm like, I'm, I'm here, I, I might as well stay. Um, I can remember I just I just sit off by myself. Um, there's a guy that led worship, um, and he was terrible. I mean, he honestly was. He tried. <laughs> he he tried. But I can remember sitting by myself, and I I, I don't want to say that guy like audibly spoke to me, yeah. but I heard a voice say, "Sir, I just missed you so much." Yeah. Man, man it's it's so good that you're home. And everything, people will say, well, that was just by chance. Um, but I, I made a decision that day on my own. Nobody else talked to me. I went home. I said, I have to change my life around. I, I know better. Um, I started really getting into the Word. I really started reading my Bible um, and do, doing all this, all this stuff. And I spent my entire senior year pretty much isolated from people. Mm. Um because I knew if I got into those environments, what the outcome would be. Yeah. And I, f- I got a girlfriend at the same time. Um, and now this was, I can say, a healthier relationship, not the healthiest, but it was it was with a girl that I didn't have to worry about that we weren't trying to be pressured to go to parties or anything like that. And the the craziest thing about my senior year of high school that I learned was. If you really want to grow in your faith and you're in an environment where everybody else is going the opposite way, it takes a lot of discipline to say no. Yeah, And so I was a part of a class, a leadership group, a leadership class to where we worked on prom stuff, uh, homecoming stuff, um, basically leaders from clubs and all that. Yeah, it's almost like a council. Like a council. And I spent the majority of the time reading my Bible alone in that class. I would do things that I was supposed to, but I would I would read my Bible. And I viewed it as a time where I don't really have anything else going on. So so why not? Um, so I did that. Um, I, I read a lot of scripture my senior year. I probably read more scripture my senior year than I ever did in college because I was dedicated to it. I was hungry for it. I knew I, I, knew I had to. And then... Um, I get an opportunity to go play at Southeastern University okay, in Lakeland, okay. Florida. Um, and I think that's when um, my salvation and my faith really took that next level step. Um, because I was surrounded by people that, that wanted the same thing. And it, when you surround yourself with people that want to pursue a relationship with God just as much as you do, it inspires you to do more and be more than you'll ever imagine to be. Because when you're in high school and you see your high school friends and they talk about the high school parties, you, you feel like you're getting left out. You feel like you have to go to these things. It's the it's the culture you're surrounding yourself in. Mm-hmm. And you know, the high school culture is one of those cultures that's very uh, manipulative. Yeah. And you know, you, you'll see people rise and fall in high school. Then I got to college. And of course, you know, even though it's a Christian university, there is still drinking and all this different stuff there. Uh, I wanted nothing to do with it. Um, and so I, that, that girl that I dated in my senior year, we eventually broke up um, my junior year around after Valentine's Day. Um, I wish we'd done it before Valentine's Day so I didn't have to buy her anything from Valentine's. That was kind of a wasted holiday. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, 
th- things happened. Once we broke up, it was almost like the chains were gone. Mm. Um, and I could really start pursuing and doing things that I feel like God was calling me to do. Um, I loved all my classes. I really invested into um, the whole thought process behind Christianity. For, for those that know me um, and spend time with me, um, I like to think deep. Yeah, I, I like to go deep. I like to go to areas to where um, normal people don't like to go because uh, not that it's exciting, but it's amazing how the human mind actually works. Uh, yeah, you definitely. start thinking about faith. And so, you know, but ever since that senior year of high school or going into my senior year of high school, when I made that decision to say, you know, I'm, I'm going to be all in. Um, I haven't looked back. Uh, and... You know, going to Southeastern was the best thing for me. Not only did I meet my wife there, um, but I met people that have radically shaped my life, um, situations and teammates. I was fortunate enough to play college soccer to where uh, my my junior and senior year, I was the captain of the team. Mm. Uh, uh, sophomore year, I was a, a leader on the team. Um, I led multiple Bible studies there. I had the opportunity to preach at local churches. Um, and it's really grown and shaped my faith. I was, um, I was the co-president of the athletic department oh, wow. my senior year. Didn't know uh, that. And so, whenever big people came in to discuss, you know, the future of the school, um, I spoke on behalf of the athletic department from the student standpoint. Um, I helped lead with Tara, my wife. Uh, we helped lead athletic chapel. And so I, I'm, I'm getting all this experience that I never thought I was going to use in ministry, but turns out I'm using every avenue that has happened to me in ministry. And so the, the life after salvation, and one of the big things I always point back to is I am constantly aware of the life I had before Jesus and the entire journey. I think for a lot of people, they, they have the, you know, the before Christ the salvation story and the life after, and they want to keep all three of those separate. Um, but when you merge all those together and it's one fluid story, um, that story is going to impact more people's lives than you'll ever imagine. And we have to understand as faith-based people and people pursuing a relationship with Christ and people that claim to be in a relationship with Christ, we have to claim every aspect of it. Mm-hmm. So that means... We have to constantly talk about our past. Yeah. Not not to just say, hey, look at how great of a sinner I was. It's, no, no, I, I was there, um, and here's how I overcame it. I think a lot of times in testimonies and stuff like that, you hear somebody's testimony, and you instantly think to where, that that's not me. I don't know how to relate to that. That wasn't my struggle. And the beauty about it is, you're right, that wasn't your struggle. So how can we take your struggle and then use it and allow God to work through it to share with somebody else? Um, I share my testimony almost once a month in various formats as a youth pastor to my students, to adults, to people I come in contact with. So that way it's a constant reminder to them, hey, um, I'm a real person just like you. Um, I have real issues just like you. Um, And we have to come to the conclusion that God's still not done. God's still working in me. I still have a lot to learn. And because of that, it's the beauty of it all. Oh, yeah. Mark Mark Batterson wrote a book um, about the Holy Spirit called The Wild Goose Chase. Okay. And uh, I didn't read the book. I just read the cover. (laughs) Uh, But what I love about that, that analogy is that a relationship with God and this whole faith journey, it honestly is a wild goose chase. Yeah. Do do I know where God's leading me? No. No. Um, do I care? No. It's it's a part of the journey. If if I knew every aspect of what God was doing, He wouldn't be God. Exactly. Exactly. And kind of seeing how God not not only like uses your past and kind of transforms it from something that you're shameful of to something that you can glorify him with Mm -hmm. 
is is amazing of how he can kind of paint not uh, ne- necessarily like paint over it but kind of kind of shows a different light about it yeah in uh second corinthians 12 9 paul writes but he said to me my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness therefore i will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so christ so that christ's power may rest on me mm. i think we forget about that verse yeah. is that i'm boasting about my past and about how weak I am, so that way Christ can be glorified more. Exactly. Rather than, I'm going to suppress all the little bad things. I don't want people to think any worse of me than they already do. And, I mean, you know, the the hip-hop phrase, real recognizes real. Yeah. Um, and so if we take that and apply that to just even pastors and youth pastors, um, the last thing a teenager wants to hear is that their youth pastor is perfect. Exactly, because that intimidates so many people. Because mm-hmm. if if you see someone who like you perceive as oh they got everything together, you're not gonna open up to them. Yeah, because yeah. like it's like they can't relate to me. Mm-hmm. There's no way they can. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's my that's my story. That's my testimony. That's the. Uh, the Reader's Digest version of it. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a lot more to it, a um, lot more crazy little details. Um, I saved those for sermon bits to just <laughs> uh, throw in there. Keep people wanting more. Um, so tell me about this um, possible new podcast you're about to start pursuing. So I used to do a YouTube podcast with my good buddy, Philip Walker. We called it Table Talk. The, the idea was simple. Uh, it was um, two youth pastors from different denominations sit down. We have a topic. We just share from the top of our head what's going on. Um, through just the busyness of scheduling, editing, you know, with, with all that, it just becomes tough. And, you know, I've had a bunch of friends, yourself, uh, my good buddy Eli Matthews that has a new podcast, Kicking It with Eli. Um you guys can check him out on Spotify. It's great. If you like soccer, it's going to be awesome. Um, and just so we've changed the name of our youth program to Youth Culture. Um, and the idea behind that is to create a Christ centered culture so that way kids can go out and change theirs. Mm. Um, and so with this podcast, we just want to simply call it the Youth Culture Podcast, to where we're going to talk about anything from life, faith, and culture. Because one thing that I've learned is that everything in life has a culture. Yes. And you're either always adding to it or not at all. Exactly. And more than likely, by not adding anything to it, guess what? You're adding to the culture. And so we want to, I want to, you know, I want to sit down with people from all walks of life and um, faith based, non faith based, just to ask them, how do you create your culture? Mm -hmm. Um, Are you okay with the culture that you've created? If you can change something about the culture that you've created, what would it be? Um, Because I know there's a lot of people out there that will just say, well, it's the culture that we live in. Culture is always subject to change. Exactly. Um, And so if we as believers in Christ believe that we have the greatest message in the entire world, which is Christ and Him crucified and resurrected for the forgiveness of sins, then wouldn't we want to implement that in every culture that we see? Yeah. And that doesn't mean go to China and Japan and change their historical culture. Yeah. But it means when you have a conversation with somebody, you're creating a culture with about your own life, about how you want to perceive yourself, perceive your faith to other people. And really kind of focus on workforces. I'm really interested by that. Like yeah. I would, like I would love to know what the, what is the culture of a law office? Mm. Yeah. As as a lawyer, who is a Christian, a Christ follower, how do you create a Christ-centered culture in the courtroom? Nice. It just, it just interests me. Yeah. And, and so when, yeah, when it comes to culture, like we were talking about earlier, y- you can either change the culture or the culture can almost change you. Mm-hmm. And so... There's like no, like you were saying, there was no like middle ground. Because either way, you're adding to that culture in some way. Mm-hmm. So, I, yeah. Um, 
But yeah, thank you mm-hmm. for coming and telling your testimony. No problem. And I'll add um, your like Twitter and stuff down in the description. Mm-hmm. And um, it's all simple, man. Stubro two for all the way around. Yeah, Stubro two all the way around. Um, and I'll add um, Eli's podcast down below. I'll add um, whatever. Eli's, Eli's actually going to be my first guest. Okay. Um, we're I can do a quick little plug yeah go ahead uh, we're, we're going to be talking about the culture of christian colleges mm. because he goes to birmingham southern yeah which is a christian university i went to southeastern university which is a christian university and the the culture there is going to be drastically different than the culture at let's say the university of alabama or yeah definitely Auburn, yeah or even sneed or um uah mm-hmm but it doesn't mean that that culture is perfect. And so just kind of want to talk about, you know, both of our experiences. Um, has that culture um, shaped us in a good way or in a positive way? Um, if we could change one thing about the culture, what would we want to change? Um, for instance, just a little snippet. If I could change one thing about Southeastern's culture, um, I would want to change the preach back mentality. Mm. So in, in chapel, what would happen would be um, there's a culture that was created about preaching back to the preacher. And so on times, we'd see a group of students that would be quote-unquote leaders, and they would the pastor or whoever would tell them, hey, we got to encourage this pastor. We want to we want to lift him up, and so we need you to say amen. We need you to clap your hands. We need you to say yes. Mm, forced All, interaction. Forced interaction. And so I'll, I'll never forget, um, my campus pastor was talking about McDonald's french fries. <laughs> and he was getting amen from the moment he started to the moment he finished it. Now, McDonald's french fries are good. Yeah, it's nothing good. to amen about. Yes. And so, but what that does, because I've seen it in effect, to when you're in that culture and then you come to a church, you get, God plants you in a scenario to where it's not a high feedback culture. You don't know how to preach. You yeah, because you're not getting that interaction. You're, you're not get to that. And so what happens is you hype somebody up to be in an environment that isn't always the culture. Mm. And so I'm not saying don't say amen to people. Oh, yeah. I'm saying if the pastor says something good, let him know. Say amen. Clap your hands. If it's good, it's good. But if it's not, yeah, don't force it. Don't force it. Yeah. Um. So to end it, I'm going to... I'm going to just let you um, say something that you want to add to the culture of this podcast. Just just something. It could be something so so deep, could be something so simple, it doesn't matter. But I'm going to I'm going to let you have the last word when it comes to that um, before we get to the outro. So, what is something you want to say to add to the culture? If I could say anything to add to a a culture of a podcast, to add to the culture of kind of what you're doing, maybe for your listeners, um, maybe even for for their own culture. One thing that I've learned, and it's a tough thing to learn, and I I actually heard it from a podcast, and I try to apply it to my life. Um, And it's, it's simple, but it's deep. Surrender the need to be right. Mm. When, you're, when you're having dialogue, especially about testimony, especially about faith, um, if you go in there with the culture of, I have to prove to them that I'm right, um, you've already lost them. Yeah. And to take that even a step further in your relationships, if all you do, every argument that you have is you're just trying to prove your point, you've already lost. Because... Greg Rochelle says, people would much rather follow a a leader that is real than that is right. Mm. And so when you pair those two together, be real and surrender the need to be right, you can change the culture. Ah, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Iceberg Lounge. Remember to like, subscribe, 
and share this podcast. Thanks again to Stuart Brandstetter, and remember, I love y'all and all to God.